How have you been? Yeah, good. I forget, when did we last speak? What was that, like more than two years ago? You were on a beach in Costa Rica. You were at a, uh, you called me from, a, I think you were doing a retreat with Nestor, right? Right before. Oh, you had wow. Oh, God, Jesus. Yeah, that's two years ago, man. And then you texted me and were like, you're having a kid. And that's the last time I heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a 15 month old now. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, man. yeah. It's uh, the biggest challenge of my life for sure, but the best. Yeah. So, okay. So then, cause it was an interesting time because you were getting ready to like kind of go big with the podcast and not have to work anymore. You were going to rely on the podcast. Yeah. So we, yeah, I, I, I just recorded the video actually about this. Literally the day he was born, I quit my job. So I've been yeah. full time. <laughs> I like to make things difficult. Yeah. Also, you did quit the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quit, quit the same day he was born. So I was like, oh, if, wonderful. I don't, if it doesn't happen now, it's never going to happen. So I was like, this is, this is like the best and the worst time to do it. So yeah, so we've been running the business now for like, yeah, nearly a year and a half um, completely. Wow. So yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, that, I, I, I give you so much credit. Way to completely commit. So is it working out? I think so. I mean, it's, it's, everything's slow for sure, you know, but um, yeah, it seems to be moving in the right direction. It's just, yeah, it's, uh, you end up quitting your day job because you want more freedom and you end up working twice the amount of hours in your own business. <laughs> I yeah. understand completely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about yourself? How's things going with you? Well, I, you know, interesting turn of events. So I followed your advice. So I was doing your, we did the breath coaching. Yep. Which was great. It was amazing. Yeah. Highly you. recommend it. Um, Cheers. And then, so you said you should do a podcast. You're like, the things you are into are, are pretty niche. And that was like, yeah. oh, so I did, and it took a long time to get going, but it's up and going now. But uh, like you said, it's all me, so it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's been really rewarding. I think we have 70 some episodes out now. Oh, wow. You, you nearly passed me now. Yeah, I've been a bit lazy with mine recently. But uh, yeah, that's good, man. And I, I have, do you found that like your knowledge has increased as well just by doing it? Yes. Yeah. So much. And that's what I wanted to talk to a bunch of people in these fields and, uh, you know, seemingly that aren't even in the same field, but they are. Yeah. And so I learn from them. You know, I think we get boxed into one thing too much. Yes. And so, yeah, I've got an opportunity to talk with like, uh, you know, professionals and masters in their practices from all different traditions and all over the globe. Yeah. It's been Very cool. really rewarding. It's the best education I've had for sure. You know, just incredible. Well, and it occurred to me when you did yours, you, so when I first heard yours, I couldn't remember who, how I heard you. It was either James Nestor or Wim Hof. Mm -hmm. It was like your first episode. Yeah. I had just read Nestor and then I found you from him, I believe. Yeah. And so then I just start listening to your podcast all the time. But when I listened to your podcast, it was like, you seem to be on a journey and want mm. to share your journey as a, almost like as a student, like I just found this thing breathing, it's amazing and changed my life and I'm going to share it with the world. Yeah. Is that kind of, is that kind that, of right? That, yeah, man, that feels, that feels really accurate. Yeah. It's just like, I don't know these things. So mm. like, let's, let's learn together. Yeah. Um, never, you know, never try and put myself out there as like a guy that knows it all. Um, but I just, yeah, just enjoy learning from these experts. Yeah, well, that was what was appealing about you. But now, all these years later, you are an expert, I would, I think, right? Well, I try to keep that white belt mentality. You know what? I just, um, I interviewed somebody last week. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting this breathing thing now. And she spent, she's a doctor who spent 45 years teaching breath work. And I was like, oh, there's still so much I don't know. She just, she just, she just gave me a whole new perspective on everything again. I was like, oh, thank you. Because that's really good to have that. That um, you, you don't want to get too uh, in the UK would say cocky. You don't want to get too confident. You know, it's good to it's good to keep that curiosity. Well, you know, and it also you know I've had a lot of questions from people. They're like, well, how much is there to do with the breath work? So when you say that there's you're still learning, and this this person you interviewed last week, you learned all this new stuff. That's a little, I think, confusing for some people. It seems like what what is there left to learn? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So what did she share with me? So she had different ways of measuring to doing the breath assessments. Her name's Dr. Rosalba Courtney. Um, I came across her through Belissa Varanich, who's world's leading mechanics expert in breathing. Anyway, and, and, and Dr. Courtney, she, she just had different way of looking at things. So she 
took some old research and redid it. So there's a guy called Buteyko who's passed away now and there's a Buteyko method. And she said, you know what? He was all about CO2. And, you know, if you've got a low CO2, so if you've got a low breath hold, that means you're more anxious. And if you've got a high breath hold, that means you're less anxious. And she goes, I don't think that's true. She goes, because I know people that can hold their breath for a really long time and they're really anxious. And I know people that can't hold their breath for a long time and they're really chilled. You know, so she repeated his studies and she got completely different results. And that was just really interesting. And so she said, um, you know, we talk a lot about dysfunctional breathing. She goes, but what functions are you actually measuring? When we say dysfunctional, what what and what's functional what fun functions of the heart functions of the respiratory functions of the um oxygen delivery and it, she just she was just on a completely different level when it came to the expertise it just it was very humbling mm. well that's interesting because i heard some some similar things recently like well do these things stand up the way we think they do so so what's the i guess it's all context driven i guess mm. So like during the, when I was, when I was listening to your podcast or reading James Nestor's breath, you know, you kind of came away like, well, which one do I do? Which one's the best? Yeah. And I don't know if there's an answer to that. What's no. your, what's your, so, and that seems to be what you just, what she was saying as well. Yeah. The best, I think she might have said this as well, but you know, I, I've been using the analogy of a Swiss army knife for a while now, which is like, you know, mm -hmm. the Swiss army knife's got all these little tools on. Um, there's no point in using the screwdriver to undo a bolt. There's no point trying to use the scissors to saw something. You know, you need to pick the right tool. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge is finding the right tool. The other part is everybody's body is different. So even she said to me, you know, some people, they need to slow their breath down um, and that will help them relax. But for some people, that's going to stress them out. And some people, they could do the Wim Hof breathing, and that's going to stress them out. But for some people, it relaxes them. So everybody's got this. The best analogy is probably like food. It's like some people do really well on keto, and some people do really well on vegan. And some people, the worst thing they can do is go plant-based. You know, they need to have the meats and the fats. And and so I think it's, it's it, the more that I go down this journey, the more I realize like, ah, everybody's different. You can't just say this exercise cures everything because that's not accurate. You have to have that. Uh, play back and forth and that's what I've been doing you know, I, went, I went you know after we worked together I really went deep on the client work so I've been taking on about four clients a month every month since uh, since I had my son really um, and every client's had a different journey I don't offer like a standard package it's literally a let me do a load of breath assessments with you mm. I've got a big old questionnaire now I don't think I'll put you through this big old questionnaire mm. um, and then each week I'm just trying to play with different techniques to see how they're landing with your body and then we'll keep a Justin, as the as the weeks go on, and that's been quite an interesting journey. Yeah, you know what? I think that's a real teacher as well. Um, but the problem with that is that it's hard to advertise because people want like I do yoga, I do breath work, I do this, yes. I do that, and it's like it. And like I think what you're finding out through your journey is that that's not really possible because everybody's different. You have to take it one person at a time mm -hmm. and be able to make yeah. those adjustments instead of just trying to fit everybody else into a, a particular box that may or may not work for most people. Yes. So mm -hmm. the breath, who would think the breath is the same way that it could be this <laughs> varied? Yeah. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are certain things. There are so, certain like universal principles that are, I think are accurate for everybody, you know, breathe through your nose as much as possible, especially mm -hmm. during sleep and exercise and rest. Uh, you know, slow your breathing down as much as possible. So I think there's this big thing, which is breath work versus breathing. And mm. so I think in the breathing category, nasal, slow, rhythmic, deep, mm -hmm. all that's all that is good for, I think, all of us. Um, but then in the breath work category, you know, that these are the exercises that we should be doing or could be doing. And I think you need to think about where your breathing is right now, based on your measurements, what your goals are, and then it's like playing with the right breath work exercises. But yeah, I think the the, the breathing itself is, is, I think we pretty much nailed that. You know, we know nose breathing is better than mouth breathing. We know slow breathing is better than fast breathing. We know being able to have a flexible rib cage and a strong diaphragm is better than not. Um, so I think those universal universal principles stand up pretty well. Wonderful. Okay, that, so that's helpful. Mm. Just, it's two different categories. So just like movement, it's like, well, it's good to lift weights sometimes. It's good to do yoga sometimes. It's good to run sometimes. But if you just do one thing all the time, yeah. and it's also a bit of a diminishing returns. Yes. So we can do like the Buteyko and try to push it to like, what is that? 42, I think. Is that the magic number there? 42 seconds? 40. Oh, I don't know. 
Well, not, I, an advantage, isn't it? Like if you hold the breath without straining for 42 seconds. Oh, the control pause. Yeah. The, yeah the, 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 what do they call it? And the bolt score. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. The control pause. Yeah. I think 40 seconds is like pro athlete level. If you can yeah. get to 30 again, this is what Rose Alba told me the other day. You know, it's like that score is quite hard to measure, but then about 10 seconds later, your diaphragm is going to flutter. Okay. That, that makes a good sense. And then I think she said about another 30 seconds is your maximum breath hold. So she, again, she gave new layers to those old measurements, which were quite mm. cool as well. So, cause that, that first impulse to breathe is quite hard to, to get right. Cause people aren't very good at being, um, what's the word, the interception. A lot of us are not mm. very good at like focusing inward. We're so busy in the yeah. mind, as I'm sure, you know, the work you do. Um, and so we're not very good at listening to those signals in our body which is why I like the maximum breathlessness test, which is the steps on the spot, because you can't really get this one wrong. It's literally how many steps can I do before I need to take a breath? Mm -hmm. And okay, you could vary the speed of your steps and all these different things, but it's a pretty solid test. Whereas mm -hmm. that first impulse to breathe, oh, was that it? Was that it? I, I've always struggled with that one because um, it's very, very subtle. Yeah. So could you explain the step one? So what is it? Yeah. That? So um, you would, uh, this comes from the oxygen advantage. You would take a a small breath in through the nose, a small breath out through the nose, you would you would hold your breath and you would march on the spot and you would count how many steps you can do. Mm -hmm. And there's a chart you can get online and good, good starts at 60. So I should be able to do 60 steps before I can't do any more. Mm. Um, most of my clients are probably in the 20 to 30 range when they start with me. And when they finish with me, they normally finish on around 100 steps. So I can get there. I can really move this quite quickly. And there's loads of dimensions to it. But um, the most important one is just consistency, slow breathing for a consistent period of time, just to help your brain reset its um, levels of sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Yeah. And, the, and you, like you said, that can happen pretty quickly. Yeah, really quickly. It's it's yeah. shocking how quick if if you do it properly and you're consistent with it. Um, I often like to describe myself these days a bit like a not not a physiotherapist but like a physiotherapist in the sense that um the client will do work with me in the hour mm -hmm. but it, the magic really happens in the week where yeah. they're not with me um and if they're practicing those techniques that i've just taught them every day for 22 minutes for that week and then they come back and see me in week two that that's where the magic happens those that don't do that and just do the breath work with me they get much much slower results and so it got to the point where i actually put that in the contract and said i can only work with you if yeah. you're willing to commit 22 minutes because I, I at the very start around the time we were working together I, I was taking on a few clients and um some people just weren't getting the results and i was like oh is it me is the breath not maybe breath work's not working properly what's going on here and i thought well no that can't be true because some clients are getting like amazing results and yeah. when i i kind of analyzed it i was like Ah, the group that are getting the results, they're doing the daily practice and the ones that don't do any breathing are the ones that are not getting, it was, it was that simple. Um, and so the minute that I put that in the contract, everybody that I work with has had just incredible results. Yeah. Well, you got me to 42 hot bolt in our second to last session. It didn't even take nice. the thing. And I can't remember the steps off of my head, but it was well more than a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was you, like I, I stuck to your program. I did your thing, but I don't remember it ever being like a challenging. It's just like, I, I, I was really happy that I had you there to work with me once a week. So there was like some sort of touch touchstone and you could guide me and give me little tips, but doing the work by yourself every day was, it was fun. I like, I liked it and I could see the results climbing so quick. It didn't take that long. Yeah. Um, and then you said something else that was really interesting about the proprioception stuff. Cause so that is where I'm, that is where I, what I do. Um, but I've also found that the breathing is like almost like one of the, um, doorways to this. Mm. So in your own, your own practice, have you noticed your own sense of um, awareness, your own body awareness, just, I would imagine just skyrocket just because of your breath work. Yeah. Yes. And no, oh, I'm, so, I'm actually very excited to talk about this. So I was in Wyoming last year, um, learning like, is, is that near you out of interest? Or was that far away? No, but I know Wyoming. I have some people, I've, I've had a few guests on the show from Wyoming. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I've got a good guy I could recommend. Um, anyway, I, I went out there for some teacher training for this, uh, 
to call it breath work cheapens it. It's more of an interceptive practice that uses breathing. It's called vivation. I don't know if you've ever come across this. And uh, it's like the second oldest breathing modality of the West, if you look on Wikipedia. And back in the 1970s, a load of people went across to India, Dan Brule, Binny Dansby, um, Jim Leonard, who created Vivation, a load of others. And, and out of that movement, holotropic breathing was, was born and rebirthing was born and a conscious connected breathing. But the only one that came back and did it differently was, was Jim and he did Vivation and it's an interceptive practice. And so he used, he's passed away now, but he used the breath to get into the feeling body. And so I went to learn this technique from the current lineage holder, Paul Hughes. And, and here's the short version. You, you, you use a conscious connected breath. You kind of quiet the mind. You focus on the strongest feeling or emotion. It could just be your, your feet touching the floor, or it could be an emotion. It could be sadness behind the eyes or some tension. And you use your attention to breathe through that particular feeling or emotion. Mm -hmm. And you almost imagine that that feeling is permeable to air. And so you suck your air through it and the turbulence disturbs it. Mm -hmm. And you get really into the detail of that emotion or feeling. And you start to notice as you really get in there, it's actually not stuck. It's constantly moving. And so you breathe through it. You enjoy the moment as much as possible. It sounds quite complicated, but you can, you, you layer all these things on mm -hmm. and you relax on the exhale. And then on the next breath, you scan the body again to find the next strongest feeling and you breathe through that. And so the whole practice is a body led breath work. Whereas I did all these other ones, rebirthing, conscious connected breathing, and it's like, <laughs> You huff and puff and you just completely disassociate from the body and mind and you just go off into outer space and there's nothing wrong with that it was it, i've had some i had i did a, a hot water rebirth in um session since we met i was in the water i thought i was a baby again i had little baby hands i was crying i i, I cried for like three hours and i was like wow this is a this is a very very powerful session but a month later i realized nothing had shifted in my life nothing had shifted i had this um you know this big release of emotions. I had this, this crazy story to tell, but nothing, nothing shifted. And as soon as I did the vivation and I started focusing on these emotions, these patterns of energy, and as I breathe through them, I realized that they're not stuck. And what they say is you're integrating at that point. So I was integrating all this stuff that I've maybe been suppressing for decades. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's, that's the short version. And it's, it's been, a, that's been a consistent practice. And since I did that, my interception has just gone through the roof all the time. That's wonderful to hear, you, you know, like there's a lot of practices that, you know, what I always tell students and myself is don't chase shiny things. So you can have really big experiences, but they might not do anything for the, for your shift of, of awareness at all. Like, of, like you said, a few months later, it's just a story. Hmm. Uh, Richie Davidson wrote about this. He called altered states versus altered traits. Mm. what we want is those altered traits that you an altered state is nice but it doesn't always translate to an altered state then what we want is that change and the body is so nice because the body's always changing the body's always in the present moment and so it sounds like what these breath uh coaches figured out is that when we breathe it's a doorway into the body sensations and then if you just stay on the body those sensations are never the same they're always changing yeah. and so you're always in the present moment and it is, I don't even think you have to be joyful. It's like, it just is joyful. It's nice to be out of habit mm -hmm. and in the change. And I think the breath is that it's like the bridge from, you know, the stagnation to the sensation. I mean, this is a very old formula and in, in most of the wet Eastern arts, this is the, this is the um, basic sort of setup there. That's the formula, the breathing into the body sensations. And then you can call it chi or prana or whatever you want to call it or body sensations. Yeah. And the breath has a way of calming you down. Mm. So you can actually begin to pay attention from that more still state and begin to notice things that if you were just racing and thinking you would just miss, which we do every day. Yeah. So I didn't mean to hijack, but essentially it sounds like oh, what they're sweet. doing. Yeah. It makes sense that he's from in, they were studying in India, Dan Brule and all these guys that they would come back with this. That, that makes perfect sense in my findings as well. Mm. Very cool. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one, I think I find it shocking that it took me four decades to realize that we're not just our thoughts. Um, and there's this whole feeling body and that you, you know, I'm talking to somebody that already knows this in great detail, but this is still very new information for me. It's like, 
hang on, there's this whole thing happening here, which is in the present moment. And we're stuck in stuck in this busy mind. And uh, there's a whole world of information here and, and experience that we've kind of cut ourselves off from. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, I was, I was feeling quite stressed, I think, you know, running the business, having the baby and, and all these things. I had this like ball of tension in my diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And um, I was making a joke to my friends. I was like, oh, that's going to give me a heart attack in my 50s. And I was kind of half joking, but half not. Um, and it was just, it was just always there and I would always ignore it. You know, I'd be like, oh, there it is again. And, you know, have, you know, all the things we do to disassociate Netflix and yeah, yeah. food and alcohol and, and all these things. And, and I think one of the best gifts I got from this vivation was to actually address that, to focus in on it, to notice it, um, to not judge it and to be curious about it. And in doing those things, it, it relaxed and it dissipated and it, it comes back a little bit, but as soon as it does, I just go back into the feeling body and I just notice the subtle changes and it just, it just lets go again. And that, that's probably been my, my biggest shift is just getting rid of that knot that was there. Yeah. And the knot does have a sense of like, it's permanent and it's, yeah, it's stuck. Yeah. But now you realize from this practice, it's not. Yeah. And you begin to get confident and you know that it's not now. So you can begin to, and you got a technique. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's the knowing that it's, it's, everything's changing all the time. Nothing's, nothing's, and again, it's a good metaphor for life. Even with my son right now, he's not sleeping and it's easy to think this is the rest of your life, but then you realize, no, everything's changing. This is going to be, you know, I'm going to be looking back on this very soon going, wow, do you remember when you couldn't sleep during the night? And that's, that period's going to be gone soon. So, um, that's right. Yeah. Interesting times. That's what I always liked about your podcast and you in general, like you have this nice honesty about you where you're just sharing, you know? So one, I would think like a lot of people who have done your work for so long would, wouldn't say, I'm still having anxiety. You know, I've been doing yeah. breath work. I trained with Wim Hof. I trained with oxygen advantage. I'm a coach mm -hmm. though. So I'm, I'm perfect. And I'm going to show you, but you're not like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I try to be, I, I you know, I've li literally just finished a video before we, we came on uh, where I've just been saying, I really let my breath pack practice slip last year. Uh, having the baby in the business, I got really good results with my clients, but I let my own practice slip and I felt the consequences of that. And it, there was a lot of shame associated with that. Um, and I just started a new thing actually about two weeks ago. I've started this um, little community of people. So there's about 120 of us now and we're breathing together every day live. It's wonderful. And it's, and so the last like 14 days, I've had the best breath practice I've ever had because I'm like, oh my God, they're waiting for me to come and join them. So I have to join them. I go live, I teach some breath work and in doing so they're getting like really nice value because they're getting to learn breathing techniques, but I'm being held accountable because I've got people waiting for me. So um, I was like, damn it, I should have done that a couple of years ago. So that, that's been quite cool just to, but, but yeah, there was definitely some shame associated with, um, you know, being the breathing guy, but not doing enough breathing myself, you know, helping everybody else, but not, not helping my own body. Um, I think that's natural. You know, I speak to a lot of other people, maybe you can resonate with this. I've got a lot, of, a lot of other people I know in the wellness profession and a lot of them tend to be very stressed and tired and some of them a little bit bitter and jealous. And, you know, on the surface, it looks like this Zen place where everybody's like Buddha, but the reality isn't that at all. And so, yeah, I just try, I just try not to, I, I don't want to fall into that trap. I just want to be like, look, I'm stressed. I'm anxious. Um, but I'm trying my best to calm down and breath works help me. Mm -hmm. That's so, like, I, so many things. So one, I was, remember I was living in India. I was in Rishikesh at the time studying yoga when I was really into yoga about 15 years ago. And my teacher was telling me there were all these local yoga competitions in India and that so many of these people were on pain medication so they could go deeper into these postures. So again, there's this perception of health and well-being, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of human beings still in kind of a competition and they're unhappy and they have some stresses and, you know, so they're presenting one face, but the reality is different when you get behind the scenes. So I think that's normal. And then your coaching thing is really interesting. So I used to do the same thing again with yoga and Tai Chi when I was teaching. I would go to my classes and be like, ah, I don't want to teach today. Why am I doing this? Now I get there and just have the best time. And I think that's right, you know, because we're sharing in the accountability. We are communal kind of beings. Mm -hmm. And when we're with 
people who are doing there's an energy to it that's and that's supportive and we need that and i think it works on zoom actually which i was surprised to discover it's like you know like me and your breast sessions were done over zoom you're in the you're in the uk i'm in the states and it was wonderful i looked so much forward to talking to you once a week even though it was on a screen which i didn't anticipate hmm. i think we're really lucky to have this technology that you have 150 people coming because in any given town like unless you're in a city you might get five to 10 people tops. But with the Zoom, you got this whole global community. Mm -hmm. It's really nice, actually. Have you found that? Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think the pandemic had a lot of problems, but it brought a lot of technology forward, didn't it? And, and one of the things was, was this, you know, and um, this whole, they call it, the, I think they call it the creator economy. Um, is set to double over the next couple of years. You know, people are doing away with traditional education systems now and joining these things like what we're doing. And um, there's a lot of information out there. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So, um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky that we've got these these platforms like you and I having this podcast now. We've not had to fly out to each other. We can have a great conversation. It's pretty much in real time. So, yeah, I feel I feel a lot of gratitude. I mean, I know there's a lot of bad press for tech and I don't know the cliche they say it's a tool right and you can use that tool for good or for bad and uh, i don't know um but yeah i feel very lucky and i feel like i think you guys are a bit further ahead i feel like the us is probably about a decade ahead in, in personal development space the uk is not quite there yet so a lot of my clients are still us based uh, a lot of people in the in the community that i've set up is a, a us based there's some uk people there as well for sure um I feel like we're, we're just slowly catching you guys now. We're, we're just getting there. You know, you've had Tony Robbins a lot longer than we've had and a lot of other information. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I feel really, really um, excited about this because there's so, you know, the knowledge you've got is just incredible. And it's just more and more people getting to hear about the stuff that you know and all these other people. It's, um, yeah, it's a really good, uh, so it's, a, it's a great time to be alive. I really feel like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, every, I think everything's a gift and a, and a curse. And so the technology thing can certainly be add to the distraction, but yeah. I think practices like you're putting forth are showing, look, we can also be mindful. We can handle anything, but first we got to take care of ourselves. And then it, then it is a useful tool, but I think it's like anything else. It can be, it doesn't matter what it is. You can exercise mindlessly. Mm -hmm. So you said something in before that was uh, interesting about your breath practice went away. You weren't doing it so much. But then earlier in the class, you were, or earlier in the podcast, you were saying uh, there's breathing and then there's breath work. So your breath work, you weren't able to attend to so much because you were, you had the kid, you were busy starting a business. But what about just the everyday breathing? Did you, so you found that because you weren't doing breath work, that was also greatly affected? Oh, that's a great question. I actually, I, I would say my breathing's always been pretty good because that's the one thing you don't need to find time for. And so, um, you know, if I was, cause I was still working out and stuff. So if I was working out, I would be mostly nose breathing. Um, if I was, um, swimming or in the sauna, mostly nose breathing, if I'm playing with my kid or I'm doing the shopping. So I, I kept the nasal, what I didn't do a very good job of was enough of the stretching. And so I, I went down a little bit of a, is it yin or yang? I went down the yin route. I think last year I did too much, too much weightlifting um and not enough stretching and so i became very very tight uh and so my rib cage i'm still dealing with the consequences now my rib cage became a lot more tight my diaphragm wasn't being worked out properly um and so we're spending this month now in the community working on mechanics getting our bodies flexible again so yeah but i would say generally breathing was pretty good but breath work not you know an example would be i probably should be doing coherence breathing every single day because i am a generally a stressed anxious person that's probably one other than forget the breathing for a second in terms of breath work doing the coherence breathing is probably one of the most powerful ways of regulating our system um and so but, oh, i haven't got time for that today and i was kind of tricking myself that i was okay because i was doing the nose breathing stuff a lot but i know that um that's 80 percent. the other 20 percent coming from coherence breathing stretching breath holds the breath work yeah oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, in context, if you hadn't been, if you hadn't had that, you would have just been a total mess because we always judge ourselves based on our previous performance. So yes. somebody who has no breath work, you know, I want to say that I'm sure you were still in a much better state because you had it. And then, so could you, so my, we actually don't do that much. Um, I don't know how familiar my audience is with all the different breathing techniques. So what is coherence breathing? 
Oh yeah. Okay. So um, this is it goes by many names. Um, in James Nestor's book, it was called the Perfect Breath. Um, it's known as resonant frequency breathing, aria breath. The Om Mani Padme Hum, right? Oh, I don't know. Is that the? Is that a? a the what, say that again. Chant, it wasn't all the chants he said. The six. That's seconds. right. That might. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. My, okay. my people know Om Mani Padme Hum, the Tibetan mantra. Okay. Well, it's also. Um, Qigong uses it as well, like a five and a half second inhale, exhale. Um, the, sh the short version is this. I just had an expert on who spent 20 years studying this, but the short version is it's a balanced breath. So it's equal in and out. There's no breath hold. It goes down to about six breaths per minute, give or take. We're, you and I are probably breathing 14 to 16 breaths. So it is, a, it is a reduced breath, a bit like intermittent fasting. We tend to engage the diaphragm a little bit more. So the diaphragm starts to do its job which is it's a second heart it's a pump it takes pressure off the heart um it starts to pump the blood differently so each breath is rhythmic the heart everything starts to balance the brain waves sync up with the heart waves we enter what some people would call a, a flow state um and it's very good for a number of things it's very good for stress resilience it's good for reducing the age of your heart. Dr. Watkins, who I just had on the podcast, who's a cardiologist, he says, if you do this for six months, it will take about 10 years off your heart, which is just incredible. You know, it's a guy that's looked at hearts. Um, it, so it's a stress resilience thing. It's great for sleep. Um, it's a good way to balance the nervous system. Um, it's, it's a good meditation practice. I think uh, I did a video called Monk Mode, a bit tongue in cheek, but when they looked at some of the uh, brainwave patterns of some of these monks that have been meditating for 20 years, Dr. Dr. Brown from Stanford, he said that he could get those same states with somebody in about six weeks by doing the coherence breath. Um, and so you don't need to do the 20 years of uh, meditation to get to that same, same altered state. Um, so it's, it's, it's very simple. It's in and out, it's balanced, it's gentle, it's soft. Um, and it's best practiced about 20 minutes a day. Um, and if you can, and, and, if there's ever going to be like one breathing technique to just keep in your um, toolkit, it would it would probably be coherence breathing because it ticks so many boxes. It's a slower breath, it's a nasal breath, it's a balanced breath, it's a resilience. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, if anyone takes anything away from this podcast, just 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 practice some coherence breathing. Coherence breathing. Yeah. Okay. So what you said. This, so this is a interesting. I'm glad I have you on here and you brought this up because I struggle. I struggle with this. So. I started, even though I'm from the West, I, I started all of my practices when I was really young, like 10. And so I just continued to go down the, these routes of, you know, Chinese, Japanese, and then Indian and Tibetan practices. And so later on, I come to like you and I hear like, you know, coherence breath is six seconds and everything's done with like Western, uh, a number, a lot of number and then anatomy where when in my practices, everything was like, either it was just embodied, we didn't think about how long our hand would go up and go down and that equaled five seconds. No, but no teacher yeah. ever said to me, do this for five seconds. I would just yeah. follow what the teacher did or the breathing and it had metaphors like the elements or, you know, just natural kind of things. And so when I come to the West and all the second stuff, it, I gotta say, it kind of stresses me out. Like, am I doing a six second breath and I was wondering if there's going to be a way, do you think, to get away from the scientific model and still use the English language to talk about this stuff? If, if that if that's even ever occurred to you, because, you know, the numbers kind of all have a sense of tension to it. Like, did you get a 90 on your test or an 80? Yeah. Like, there's a certain amount of judgment with numbers, mm. like you're doing good or you're doing bad. Where just being embodied and raising the hands and you're breathing and doing all the things, but you're not conceptually thinking of it like that, where the numbers and the measurements keep you into that left brain thinking mode. Yeah. Exactly what we don't want when we're trying to go into these relaxed states of just sensing. Yeah. Does that, has that occurred to you? This is something yeah. I thought was a personal thing, so I don't know. No, it has. It, it, it has for sure. You know, I've been using the term feel good breath work recently. I just the class I did earlier, you know, I was like, look, I'm going to be doing I was doing some stretches. And I was like, just do, just do what feels good for you. If you want to hold for a few seconds, hold for a few seconds. And, you know, re and I'm trying to get people to go in inside and listen to their bodies and, and do a lot of awareness. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I, I only really come from a Western philosophy, so I don't. I, I have a, a very small idea of what else is out there, but but you know, a millimeter. Um, and my whole thing is is logic and spreadsheets and data and uh, you know, and, and the stuff that I know that we've lost is intuition and feeling and and trust in our bodies and our ourselves. And I think yeah, we're doing ourselves a huge disservice. Um, when it comes to the coherence breathing, actually, there was a guy, Dr. Chris Walton, who wrote the Gamma Mindset. He was telling me that you can find your pulse and you could breathe in for five heartbeats and breathe out for five heartbeats. And that's true coherence. And I thought that's interesting. I haven't really explored that too much. Um, but, but really, you are then actually syncing your breath with your heart, which is pretty cool. And the more you do it, the more it will slow down. You have Qigong's and movement practices where you tap into your pulse of the body the body's heart beat and then move with with it mm. so that your actual internal pulse is guiding your movement that's cool from this sense of like just letting go and getting into this rhythm much like you were saying with the pulse mm. or i notice like if i'm doing exercise i'm like okay i gotta do 10 reps or run for a half hour you know there's two the time oriented thing seems to cause a little stress in my mind at least yeah, I, I, I think you're onto something here. Um, yeah, I, I know that some people will say with the coherence breathing, you should not count. Um, so there's, a, I mean, a lot of the exercises I've got on my YouTube channel, they're just, they're just bells or, or dings yeah. or, or piano or something. And so you yeah. don't, you remove, you remove the uh, need to use anything other than just breathe with the music. Although it's interesting, recently I've had a few people come out to go, I want to breathe slower than that. And I was like, brilliant do it that's that's the perfect thing forget what i'm saying that's just a suggestion you mm. you find what feels good for you yeah and i think you know as you as that, this i'm just thinking of this now but i probably the reason i enjoyed your breath uh, work uh, coaching with you is because you did all the work for me i i breathed but you told me when to start and stop mm. i didn't have to think about it where when i was on my own i was trying to like pace and so i think it's the same with like any sort of when you're leading a fitness class or something or what you're doing with all your students, it's like they can just let go and let you take care of the details. So they're mm. going to have a more rewarding experience, I think, instead of having to think like, oh, I got to time myself or I got to go to work or yeah, this kind of thinking mentality that is mm. kind of the antithesis of these practices in some way. Yeah. I mean, I'm at the very start of this journey you're talking about because I've, you know, I've only really in the last five months started to understand breath, body awareness, body wisdom, body leadership, all these things are very new to me. Um, and very, it's very exciting. So I've been very much, again, analytical spreadsheets, study. Um, so yeah, so just starting to try and trust my intuition a bit more now. So I'm, that's kind of a fairly new path for me. Yeah. But in my opinion, I think you've done the hard work. I think this will be much quicker. <laughs> I think this, <laughs> you did the hard work for us. So when we had first met, you had just done also, um, you had been studying with Wim Hof and you had done the big, you would hike to the top of the mountain in shorts with no shirt. You'd done the breathing. Yeah. And then I saw during COVID that he had done a study at University of Michigan, but I haven't heard any more about it, where he wasn't allowed to breathe, like do breath work. They put it, they put him in the cold and he was able to raise the body temperature, but he wasn't allowed to do any movement or breathing to get there. Mm. It's all just with the mind. Wow. And I feel like that's what maybe, isn't that kind of what you were doing with hiking up to the mountain? I mean, you weren't able to do intense breath work as you were hiking. Yeah. It's interesting. So I interviewed uh, Yosef Kerbel, uh, who I think has the current, I think he still has the current world record for being in ice. And he did two, two hours, 33 minutes. And I don't think he wasn't doing breath work. I don't think he was, he was meditating. He was bringing up things to do with his children. And he was, I think he was using his fingers as like an anchor for different things. Um, I don't think he did breath work there. I, you know, I'm not a big ice guy. I, yeah, I know I, I spent some time with Wim and um, I did, did the mountain. I, I feel like, and this is just my not very deep version of this our body's really freaking adaptable and you know the first time you go into the ice water it's a shock the second time it's less of a shock the tenth time it's like jumping into a bath your body just kind of goes oh okay we know what to do here 
and, and the body kind of warms itself up. What Wim's doing though is a bit more out, you know, a bit more advanced. He's able to warm his body up with his mind. We, they, they didn't teach us this. They just got us to, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. When we did the Wim Hof thing, they got us to walk up a mountain in our underwear. They did not get us to walk down a mountain in our underwear. Because when you're walking up a mountain, you're, you're getting warm. You know, you're, you're exerting energy. The, the minute we would stop and have to wait for somebody, we would all start shaking. They would start doing the breathing. Um, so it's not, to, it's not to dispel any of it because it was really empowering. Um, but I know, I know a guy in the US and he can he can make one hand warm and one hand cool, you know, just by thinking about it. He, he doesn't know how. It's something he's been able to do since he's a kid. So um, I don't know. You know, I don't know if you uh, – do you know who John Chang is? Have you ever come across John Chang's work in Indonesia? So he was a Qigong master that kind of broke the rules. Uh, and he went on, he went on like, TV and showed his skills. Um, and so there's a documentary called Ring of Fire from the 1970s. It was two British guys, and they found John Chang by accident. And he and one guy had, like, eye cancer, so John Chang was working on his eye. And it's all, it's all on YouTube. You can see it. And he's putting, like, a little bit of electric into um, the needles through his finger, like a little shock. And, and he's like, I'm just doing what an uh, electric eel would do, yeah? And so this girl, she lifts up her top just to show her belly, and he, he puts, like, electric shock into her belly. Um, and then a few seconds later, he crumples up some newspaper, and he, he sets it on fire. And oh my God. and it'd be easy to fake that, right? You know, but I, I, got, I found the director. He's in his 80s now, and I interviewed him. I was like, you know, tell me now, is this true or not? He's like... It's 100% true. He did even more stuff. He was a true Qigong master, and he, he, but he paid the price for it. He, he was not meant to get famous off this. It damaged his body. He damaged his, his liver. Um, and so anyway, I'm, the reason I'm sharing this story is like what Wim is doing and what John Chang was doing, our body clearly has, I believe, these insane abilities that we just don't know how to tap into anymore, you know, and, and there's all this stuff out there and I find it really exciting. Um, but this John Chang, he'd spent 18 years regulating his emotions to be able to put that chi into that space to, to do these things. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't really kept up to date with Wim. I'm going to hopefully see him in a couple of weeks. He's coming to London. Um, but yeah, I, I, the whole cold thing fascinates me, but I never went down that route in the end. I, I did the cold exposure. I got to feel it. And then I moved straight into breath work. I never, never did the cold stuff with clients or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just, so I'm, I think what you're saying is great and valid. I think our body has all this capacity to do all these different things and you can take it in different ways. And Wim's obviously a master at his technique. Um, yeah. But I think that it's more than just breathing. I think the breathing's one aspect, but I also think the breathing, he maybe the breathing and the cold in his case, but just the breathing puts you in connection with your body and then what you want to do with your body i think you can go in different directions and tap into these potentials but i do believe the breathing is a key i mean all the buddha is teaching this right from day one to the new monks when he was alive like start just sit down don't talk breathe that's, mm. that's the starting point <laughs> yeah uh, if you just start there and then in nestor's book he brought up the tibetan monks mm. Tumo, and everybody's talking tumo, 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 and this is this word, you know, is specifically Tibetan. Mm -hmm. In their practices, they're not really huffing and puffing. Mm -hmm. In fact, their breath is so slow to almost be imperceivable, and then the heat's coming. But it's the exact opposite of the Wim Hof technique, as far as like breathing really heavy. Like you're around them, they don't seem like they're hardly moving or you don't even recognize that they're almost alive sometimes. But then the heat's wow. unbelievable. Um, but so as I was curious to hear about this study he did in Michigan, because I was like, well, that actually sounds more like what the Tibetans are doing. Mm. Where, it, where it really is just, it's the mind. Where you yeah. use the breath becomes settled because of the mind. Instead of using the breath to settle the mind, mm -hmm. you can do. But yeah. I think at a higher level, down the road mm -hmm. your your breath just becomes so slow because your mind's so relaxed and you're so just in the body and you're just there's a freedom there where everything just becomes so relaxed and vast yeah i love that that sounds really nice it's um yeah we uh we, we we've added some movement practices to our coaching program now so i do a lot of like shaking and tapping with clients um, particularly before we do any sort of like coherence or slow breathing, because I just, 
so many people have got quarters old and they're just all stressed out and you know i often like think about like children in school and how cruel it is we make them sit down for six hours every day you know and they've got all this energy and it's like and i i had or well, i have adhd and uh, the last thing that you could get me to do is just sit down and pay attention in school and i really struggled you know but give me something i enjoy like this or editing a video i can spend hours doing this um but yeah i, I this idea of like we need to quiet the mind and i think you're right at a high level i think practitioners can do that but i think for the vast majority of well speaking about myself anyway um if you get me to just be still it's really hard but if you get me to do a chunk of movement first um i i, I can you know vipinasa and all these things i can uh sorry shavasana i should say you know once we've done the movement we can relax and i, I found that to be one of the most powerful breath tools out there is let's let's get rid of some of this energy and then we can we can calm the mind and body you know what i think you just hit on like really the key point here is that because i listened to all these things with breathing and with practice and movement and all this but you know we're really in a society that is stacked against us as far as our biology goes like making kids sit in desks and really do you have adhd or you're just a normal human being and sitting in a desk yeah. is abnormal and so, you know, it's good that we have these techniques because, you know, when a lot of these were invented, you know, like the time of the Buddha or Qigong, these people lived in the, the natural world. And so we can take their practices. Well, I think that's what you're doing and why it's so valuable is like, all right, but we're not in the natural world. So we're going to have to figure out a way to kind of hack this or deal yeah. with this really bad situation. But it's also not your fault that you're not breathing well. It's not your fault that you're dissociating, right? You can pat yourself on the back a little bit and we we'll, we'll figure out a way through it because we're strong we're resilient we're smart but it's not your fault because you haven't got the education you know we didn't have mike in first grade teaching us how to breathe which we should and hopefully there's some kids out there now that are listening to your podcast that will do mm -hmm. and get benefit that wasn't there for me and you yeah hope so you know i uh, there was a it's back oh maybe eight months ago now i know in new york they they passed something that has brought breath work into school. So I think they're teaching five minutes of breath work a day now, like it's mandated, which is pretty cool. Um, so stuff's moving, you know, people are starting to wake up to this breath. You know, I, I've got all the stats, right? Because I've got the YouTube channel with all the views. And so I can see what's going on. And I can see over the last seven years, you know, it's just going like that. You know, I think we hit 700,000 views last month, something like that. You know, it's insane. You know, it's insane. And, um, but it's not good because people, I can see what they're searching for as well. And they're searching for how to stop a panic attack, how to reduce anxiety, how to feel less stress. I can't sleep. What breathing exercise should I do? And so um, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are suffering, you know, and they're looking for looking on YouTube for, for some help for that sort of thing. But so, so breath work has gone up, um, but I don't think it's gone up for the right reasons. I think it's gone up for the wrong reasons, which is we're feeling worse. The, the world is not helping us, you know, sitting at the desk, we're drinking poisoned water, tap water, our food is poisoned with all these weird chemicals and stuff, you know, we're not moving. Um, but the shining light is all this information's out there. So you can empower yourself to move your body, breathe, get daylight in your eyes, put your feet on the grass, twist your body, you know, meditate a little bit. So it's the kind of best and worst of times, I think, at the moment, you know, there's a lot of information out there, but, but there's a lot of people that are still asleep and they don't know, they just, and, and the thing I think I've found most interesting was this background radiation or this ambient anxiety, I heard somebody call it the other day, you just get used to what you're used to. And it's only when like, I don't know, like I've got got a baby and so I've not slept for like over a year yeah so but then I get used to it but then if I get one good night's sleep the next day I'm like oh my god I'm back oh, I forgot what this was like and I think it's the same with our health I think you know we can breathe poorly eat poorly sleep poorly and and and, and our body's so adaptable we just we just make it on your baseline but then if you get a good breathing exercise in or you know you have a nice hot bath or you go and do some nature walks you 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 remember the old ways it comes back to you and you're like, ah, and I think that's the moment of awakening where we can go, ah, can I, can I, can I go deeper into this now, now that I've started to get a bit of, you know, a bit of clarity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that right on, I think, you know, I had some people on my program talking about uh, ecology and mindfulness and they're like, well, if people were really mindful, then you wouldn't do what you do to the environment. Yeah. 
bit of, bit of, bit of self love, bit of curiosity. Um, yeah, bit, bit, bit of just focusing inward. Um, stop scrolling as much and, uh, <laughs> Stop looking outside for the answers, which is such a cliche these days, right? You know, but it's a cliche for a reason. You know, I've, I've I heard a, a wonderful quote from a business guy actually, and he said, "You've already achieved goals that you said would make you happy, and they didn't. So why do you think the next goal is going to make you happy? Oh yeah, I'd be so happy if I'd be so happy when." And I, I don't know when he said it in that way. You've already achieved goals you said would make you happy, and they didn't. Um, that was like stop chasing those things oh if i had those shoes or that car or this many followers you know i remember thinking oh my god if i could just get to a hundred thousand followers i would be so happy it doesn't mean anything you know it's, it's, it's complete bs um so yeah i it is a cliche but yeah the more we can find a bit of quiet time and just be and just be with ourselves which is really hard to do these days for so many reasons um yeah but yeah i think it's like just find a bit of space for yourself each day it's, it's pretty powerful i think it yeah and i think if well, like what you're saying with the followers i think that in some ways equates to well if i have enough money then i can afford food in my apartment then i can relax mm. i don't have to be a slave at this job every single day and i think that's that kind of security is what we need in order to really sit and do breath work if we can't afford our life and we're worried about cuts at work or this that and there it's really hard to not have stress and then we i think we blame ourselves oh i'm i'm i have anxiety or stress well, well yeah but that's not totally your fault the environment's a little stressful you're in right now you can't afford your yes. you can't afford things and like you said the things you can't afford like you can't afford quality food so you're eating a bunch of junk food and that's not making you feel better so yeah. I, but the things we want are quite simple though aren't they it's like we want a roof we want quality food and time for ourselves and with our friends and family. I heard, um, so I really would recommend, I'll, I'll talk to you about this guy afterwards, but there's a guy that taught me the, the vivation stuff. And he said to me the other day, he goes, you know, people take breath work or, or maybe any practice, maybe you can relate to this or your listeners can. We take our practices way too seriously. Mm -hmm. And he goes, the most powerful school uh, skill that he's come across is levity. The, the, the ability to just just enjoy and just have fun and laugh at yourself and so I, I fell into that trap of being the serious breath worker and I'm just like just enjoy, just you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you look silly I do some silly poses sometimes I'm scrunching my face up it's, you know just just have fun with it so that's that's the I haven't perfected this yet but that's what I'm trying to that's the kind of thing I'm working towards at the minute is just not taking it too seriously we're, we're all going to die one day I'm just trying to have a good time while we're here so same with my sleep. I, I, I found out how bad it is for you when you get poor sleep. And so I did a load of research on sleep and I figured everything out and I ruined my sleep for two years. I got so every night I was getting stressed that I wasn't going to get the right amount of sleep. <laughs> and, and it took me about two years to relax. Go, oh, sod it. I'll just sleep whenever I need to sleep, you know, and then my sleep got better. So we're funny, aren't we? The way that we um, we, we sometimes just sabotage ourselves. It's, it, it is funny. No, that's that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we need that. Maybe it's just the growing spurts and the maturity. Yeah. I've noticed that with a lot of the body practices too, at the beginning, and I guess this is by design. A lot of them are like quite complicated and require a whole lot of effort, but then mm. like always like the top masters, it's like ease and simplicity. Mm. But when you give that to a new student, they just totally miss it. It's yes. like they have to go through the rigor of growing before they can finally relax. It was like, oh, this was there all along, but you needed to pay and struggle and sweat and bleed before you could achieve what you've always had. Hundred percent. I'm exactly like that. I'm, I'm, I've take, taken up jujitsu again, and um, I'm, I'm so tight. I'm just holding on for dear life, and all the instruction I'm getting is just relax. It doesn't matter if you get beaten. You just got to relax and let, let the fluid movements happen because you're not going to grow in this position of being locked um and even though i'm hearing that i'm still i'm still like no i can't let go you know so it's um it's a bit of a leap of faith same in skiing i did skiing a few years ago and i was so tight i couldn't move and you gotta relax so and the same in rock climbing actually i did the uh, bouldering years ago and i was really holding on as with my biceps and like, you just gotta let go and let your shoulders do the work so i've heard this message over and over again about relaxing about being fluid about you know enjoying it more and just trusting the process and yeah yeah. I had a martial art teacher that used to tell me when we would when we would spar or fight, he would always say, invest in loss. 
He's like, don't try to win. He's like, when you lose, you learn. I like that. He's like, if you figure out a way to win at the beginning and that carries you through, he's like, you've never, you're not going to learn anything. And then you're going to meet an opponent that's going to be able to defeat that little trick you've learned to beat other people. Yes. But if you just stay open and relax and let yourself lose, what you're learning is all these different ideas and techniques and adaptable adaptability. So the mastery will come in the kind of a spontaneous way when you get older. I love that. Invest in loss. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that you've done all these different things too, jujitsu and rock climbing. I'm the same way. I just, I encourage everybody to play and do the new thing. Yeah. Don't everything gets boring after a while. Yes. And then what's so great about your breathing is it's like any activity, the breathing's kind of the key. Can I maintain the breathing in the rock climbing? Can I maintain the breathing in the mindful awareness of breathing in the jujitsu? Especially jujitsu, that's very important. I know they stress that there. Yeah, it's the, I, I wear a little nasal strip, and everyone thinks I'm a bit weird. And my whole goal is to map, is to nose breathe now ninety. Well, I try and aim for hundred percent nasal breathing. Uh, and in jujitsu, people do a lot of things where they try and suffocate you, and you know, and so it's uh, the breath is is critical actually. And um, it's interesting that you, you get this awareness at the end of a like a round or a fight. You look around and everybody's, <gasps> uh, and I'm really trying to be a bit stoic and nasal and and not always. You know, sometimes I push myself too far. But um, it is interesting if you can control the breath. It does it does give you a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. I had a, a really famous jujitsu uh, teacher, coach, fighter on my show a couple of times now, Tim Cartmel. Oh, I'll check him out. I don't know him. Okay. Yeah, it was wonderful. He did one of the first shows and he came back second season and talked to me again. But he also, I go to his workshops when he comes to town and travels around and teaches. And literally at the last one I was at, his top student that travels with him had Breath by James Nestor. And we were all talking about because he's all about the breathing. Yeah. So I, I mean, so I don't know what gym you're at, but you need to just pass around Breath and tell him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll do. Because they were really into it because it's going to increase performance. Huge. It, it, reduce stress it means you've got more more ability to actually learn the jiu-jitsu as well because when your body's when your brain's in stress it can't learn as well um so yeah loads of benefits of slowing the breath down in martial arts loads mm -hmm. body yeah. awareness um you're up in so you're up in london do you know of ian mcgilchrist and his work I ian ian Ian. Yeah, I, I, only because I interviewed a guy called Bruce Parry, and Bruce Parry had Ian on his on his uh, documentary, which was called Tawai. I don't know if you've seen Tawai, uh, which is a, like Voice of the Forest. Yes, I, I know of Ian through that. Yeah. All right. Well, he does all this. I've tried to get him on the show. I haven't been successful yet. I'm going to keep trying, but uh, I love his work, and he does this whole thing with the left right brain hemisphere. Mm. Essentially, it's between like a conceptual model of thinking, thinking, thinking. Yes. First experiencing. And that when we like, so, so essentially like, you know, if you go to a symphony orchestra or something and you sit and you, you don't think, is this music good? You're just experiencing it. Yes. Right. But then he's like, you know, then later you could break it all down, put all the notes on the table and think it through and who wrote it and the history he's like, but that's not listening to it. These are two different ways of paying attention or being in the world. So it's, I think it's like with the breathing or, or rock climbing, it's like if you're thinking about the activity, then you're not really doing the activity. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And the breathing, he also equated being in the activity is, a, is an embodied experience. Thinking about an activity is a disembodied experience. Mm. And we do like jujitsu or whatever rock climbing. We want to be in the experience. We don't want to be thinking about because then we're always a second behind. Mm -hmm. or trying to predict and then that never goes as planned so to truly be in the experience there has to be a relaxation i think the breathing is the bridge on those two hemispheres right mm -hmm. we're thinking thinking thinking. we use the breath to get into the experiential state which is the embodied state yeah i i yeah i for sure i i find it like just so fascinating how when you're doing any of these kind of um physical body things um you 
you become the experience. So for me, time changes completely. It becomes this experiential time. You know, I might be rolling with somebody for five minutes and I haven't once thought about what's for dinner. You know, where am I going on holiday? What's my credit card doing? I, I'm just in those five minutes and it's, it's completely present and I'm feeling what's going on and I'm, I'm thinking and, and not, sorry, not thinking, I'm trying to get out of a certain move. And, um, it's, it's a lovely way to experience time. Whereas the, what do they call it? The, um, the other version of time, the linear version of time is, you know, oh, today's Monday and tomorrow's Tuesday. And I did this yesterday and, you know, everything's been kind of, it comes back to what we said at the start, really, you know, everything's calculated and measured and that's quite stressful. But when you're in the momentary time, it's lovely, you know, things are just happening and there is no tomorrow. There is no yesterday. It's just, again, I know this is a cliche, right? But I've, I've been experiencing this a lot recently with vivation, but also with jujitsu, just being in that momentary time. Yeah, and the, the jujitsu, because I think sometimes with rock, like rock climbing too, there's just because of there's a little bit of danger involved. Mm. Requirement for paying attention, the stakes are higher, so you drop that in sense. quicker. I like that. But then there, you know, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning with counting and stuff. Mm. It does have a way of keeping us dissociated in our whole, especially like we're trying to do an embodiment practice, like breathing, and then mm. I'm saying now count. It's like whoa. These two things are almost <laughs> like in a little bit, but our whole society is against us in this way. So you keep saying it's like a cliche and unfortunately it is, but I think it's a fundamental aspect of being human, this, this cliche. And it's like, we'd all be better off, but our whole day is structured around numbers and time, Yeah, which is completely again, arbitrary. Like think about the time when like Buddha's teaching breath work or Qigong's are being created or these yogas. It's like, there was no clocks. There was no sense of waking up and, and clocking in. Yeah. You rose with the sun. You did yeah. the farm if you were a farmer, but everything was like on its kind of natural rhythms. It's only been in the last, I don't know, several hundred years where we get on this time industrial yeah. kind of mindset. And, and it creates yes. a disconnectedness, right? When you're living it, when you're out in the woods, I mean, you've camped and done these retreats and stuff when you're in the elements, there's an interconnectedness. You realize you're part in the whole. You never think you're a separate thing. Yes. And that breathing again is what is such a, it's the key connector. Mm. Without the trees, without the breathing, I'm not existing. I'm, I will die. I have to mm -hmm. have this relationship of give take with my environment. Yeah. Uh, and being linked to the, to the natural light source as well and touching the earth and being grounded and yeah, it's, you know, this thing we're all looking for this, you know, we, what, what's the thing that people say the most these days we're disconnected uh, and at, at more than one level. And I think at the most fundamental level, we're disconnected from the planet, right? We're not touching the planet, you know, mm -hmm. we're not getting daylight in our eyes, you know, we're indoors, we're touching mobile phones that are plugged into sockets that are charged and full of the wrong energy. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know, Nestor says this a lot when he, if you watch any of his podcasts recently, he says, you know, the modern world is conspiring against us. And yeah. I think he's, he's really nailed that. And so we have to be aware of that and we have to sidestep it and find the loophole and the way to get the clean water and touch the earth and get the daylight in our eyes first thing and, you know, get that phone away from us when we're sleeping and, and, and all that stuff, you know, it's, um, requires a lot of a lot of due diligence because if you yeah. if you take your eye off the ball the modern world will just will just sweep you up you know it's it's it requires a lot of uh, and most people are tired you know most people are exhausted and they haven't got the time to be going to biohacking conferences and no. you know learning about all this stuff but I, what i do like is like the most the best stuff is the base, the basic stuff, you know, taking a deep breath outside, touching the planet with your feet, you know, drinking clean water, you know, these are these are pretty basic things that you don't need to go and research. I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you for having me on. Um, it's been lovely to connect and we'll have to do it the other way as well. If you want to come on to take a deep breath, I'd love to pick your brains about all the stuff you've been doing and uh, share the good word about all your work. Yeah, anytime. This was wonderful connecting with you again, Mike. I really appreciate yeah. you coming on and sharing. And Thank you for all the great work you've done. Cool. Take it easy, Mike. You too. Take Go it off. easy. Cheers. Bye. Bye.